Hi, this video I want to talk about the Danish Gambit and I'm going to show you a game between uh, Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces and um, Ildar Ibragimov with the black pieces, both uh, grandmasters. Um, but first what I'm going to do is show you basically what happens in the Danish Gambit. First, what is the Danish Gambit and show you what happens when White just gets exactly what he wants in the position. So, this game is, again, we're stepping into our time machine. We're going back to Paris, 1863. This game is between two unknown players to us. Player with the white pieces, name, his name is Linden. And with the black pieces, player named Max Zusky. The game started out E4. E5, D4, E takes D4, and there's a few continuations played here. C3, gambiting a pawn, because this is the romantic chess era, where it was manly to take, take on all gambits. So we see that white is giving up material here. Bishop C4. Still giving up material. C takes B2. Threatening the rook on A1. And making another queen. As well as the bishop. On C1. So finally. Black captures. And this. My friends. Is. Would constitute. The Danish gambit. And in all of his glory. And we can see here. By counting. Uh, the number. Of pawns. That. White is down two pawns, or black is up two pawns, depending on how you want to look at it. But we're looking at it from white's, perce white's perspective. So, white is down two whole pawns. And if we were to remove all the pieces, save the kings from the board, we see that uh, white would just lose in the end game. There's a huge majority on the queen side. We see that. Black has four pawns to one on the queen side. So that's an easy end game win for uh, black. Therefore, white strategy is uh, easily uh, defined here. It's basically he has to win by checkmate. <laughs> he has to win by an uh, attack so overwhelming as to gain enough material to compensate for the pawn deficit and or gain his pawns back uh, somehow. So what does white have here uh, to justify this uh, deficit or in compensation? Well, as you can see, those bishops uh, already posted up and on ideal diagonals, right? One bishop stands unopposed e2, the dark square bishop, and the other bishop stands unopposed uh, c4, and we can argue that they're probably both at their best squares even now in the game. I would say that if I could wave a magic wand, this bishop would probably probably be better off here at b3. The reason why is to avoid attacks that can occur via d5 after knight f6, which is the um, main idea in this as well as, as in other openings. Uh, so... That's one thing. The bishops have two beautiful open diagonals. Um, of course, black has no developed pieces, so white is ahead in development. White also has a pawn on e4, restricting d5, so white has more space and is ahead in development. And not only does he have open diagonals, but notice the b, c, and d ranks all uh, semi-open. In other words, white has no pawns on those ranks and they can be occupied uh, by the rooks. So, white has open files. Excuse, yeah, open uh, ranks and files because the third rank is open as well as, as well as the fifth rank right now. But the third rank is important because that rank can be used as a launching point for the white rooks. For instance, if they go to the C file and D file, they can go to C3 and D3 and shift over to the king side. So, 
in compensation for the two-point deficit, White has um, a lot of potential for a creative play and combative play. But uh, the only downside is, is he is down two points. And as black strategy would dictate to basically weather the storm, try to catch up in development, and judiciously trade off pieces, and then realize his material advantage sometime down the road. So... I hope that was an adequate explanation. So let's continue now. So after C takes B2, Bishop takes B2. Black played Bishop B4. A natural move. Uh, aiding development with check. And it's hard to uh, deny the merits of that move. Because black has to, white has to take time to defend the king somehow. He can play king F1 here, knight D2 or knight C3. Here, white opts for knight c3, which is a respectable development move. And black, white goes to his natural square. The only downside I see for this is it hinders the uh, development a little bit because the knight jumps right in front of the bishop. So therefore, and breaks the, um, you know, blocks the action of the bishop on b2. So maybe knight d2 is a little better here. Or king f1. So anyway, knight c3 is played, knight f6, again, a natural looking move, um, white, black is ready to castle queen side, and he is trying to catch up in development, as he should be. So now knight g e2, white still has a huge lead in development here. And the next logical move would probably be just a castle. Right, develop, keep developing knight c6 because that's really uh, black's major deficit is since he took time to capture those pawns, he material, so now it's time to catch up in development. And that's where his concentration uh, should lie right now. Black plays knight takes e4, so he takes a third pawn, right? And this is bad because again being behind in development like that uh, he's asking uh, for trouble here okay better is just castle and after castle d6 uh, white does not really have enough compensation for two pawns I mean white is definitely actively placed but does he have compensation for two pawns? Definitely not here. So he takes knight takes e4. White just keeps developing. That's the name of the game. Knight c3. Knight takes c3. Bishop takes c3. And bishop takes c3. Now what's wrong with this picture? Black has traded off some pieces. But he is back at square one with no development. It looks like he's still at the beginning of the game and giving White some free moves. So that's why I mentioned earlier, although that his strategy is to judiciously uh, trade off pieces. And the key word is judiciously. In other words, with caution at the right time. And here... For him just to trade off where he has no development, um, very bad for the position. So now you have four open files, and now white will just, you know, pursue simple attacking moves. So queen g5 for black, trying to keep uh, white out of, say, g4 with his queen or h5. Really simple. Rook e1. Now the king must move. King d8. And let me just show you if king f8. Again, open diagonals. Bishop b4, d6. And now you just take that. Always look for those kind of moves when you're heading development. Don't be afraid to invest pieces. And the game is over. All right? Hope you can see that. So he went to the other side, king d8, and now white played f4, which is kind of a mistake here. 
h4 is much stronger deflecting the queen so for instance queen g6 then queen e2 threatening mate on e7 knight c6 bishop d5 why bishop d5 because the mate is guarding e7 the bishop threatens to get rid of it f5 there's bishop takes c6 now you say well why f5 because uh, this bishop is going to be removed and you need something to guard against this threat so f5 allows the queen to be able to assist the rook and it's moved to e8 so f5 bishop takes c6 and now then the rook can come over and that's because this queen is protecting that square if if the pawn is still on f7, then the rook will just be captured. However, with all those heroics, black still uh, loses material after queen takes e8, queen takes e8, rook takes e8, king takes e8, and bishop d5. And he's just down a piece because remember, the knight was captured. And so we can see how the space advantage, right, the lead in development, etc., turned into... Uh, material advantage so h4 was the move there in the game f4 was played with a similar idea however we see that this diagonal is open for a check and <laughs> but <laughs> that's the that's the move for queen c5 although black is still lost here or still in trouble rather or and if queen takes c4 here right then just bishop takes g7 and white is uh still in control however the greediness does not stop and it's funny looking at these old games because it's like i can't believe what i'm seeing sometimes that these players with so you know with this greedy but I know that you know it's just amazing to me <laughs> but I, I know that you know that there's players today that still play like that but this guy just takes every pawn that's possible so after queen takes f4 I mean white had black has seven pawns or three so he's up four pawns but has no development and you know what happens the bishop takes g7 attacking that rook, rook g8 and now the tactics start to uh, start to fly. Can you find can you find the move for black here? Excuse me for white, right? To shut to shut black down immediately. It's queen g4, and this is basically uh, based on simple deflection of the queen, so that bishop f6 made is possible. In other words, if you remove this black queen from the board. Then bishop f6 mate happens because the rook is here guarding this file and the bishop would be shutting this down. So that's what that's about. So he can't capture the queen. And remember I always say make moves with double, you know, dual purposes if you can. Try to get as much out of the move as possible. This move is both a defensive move and attacking move. How is it defensive? Because it protects the bishop right here. And how is it offensive? Well, it attacks the queen. So notice how that one move, because we see this bishop here is on priest, this bishop is on priest, and we see that white has so much lead in development that he can make a move like that, protecting and everything. In other words, you got one, you had two and you got three pieces just in the air. Because of the poverty of his position. So he plays queen d6. Right? To keep an eye on the dark squares. And of course, bishop f6 works anyway. Why? Because if queen takes uh, f6, then simply... Queen to g8, taking. Okay, so we've seen the uh, brutality of that game, and what happens if White is just basically able to 
you know, implement his his will and idea in the game. And that's the idea of the Danish Gambit. And it's an old game, and you hardly ever see that played anymore, especially between grandmasters. Sometimes you'll see it between grandmasters and amateurs. Uh, one of the things about that opening is that players normally, even uh, if a player does want to play it with the white pieces, it's a fun opening to play. It's just that uh, many times players with the black pieces will not accept all those pawns, you know, all the way down to playing bishop, uh, having to, you know, playing bishop to b2. He might accept one pawn, but not the, the other pawn. So, again, in our time machine, we go to the 129th New York State Championship round six. This game took place March 9th, 2007. And this is between a young, younger, Hikaru Nakamura, who is 2647 already, his age, and uh, known for his uh, openings and, um, you know, playing offbeat openings and his um, sharp tactical style against a veteran grandmaster, Ildar Ibragimov, who was 2599 at the time with the uh, black pieces. So let's check it out and let's look at the game now. Um, Black's perspective. So again, Nakamura has the white pieces. A Bragmov, Bragmov with the black pieces. The game began e4, e5, d4. And uh, again, aiming for open lines and smashing the opponents with the lead and development. <laughs> he takes d4, so a Bragmov takes the first pawn, right? So usually. 99% of the times, black accepts that pawn because if not, you risk an inferior position. I mean, you could try, you can play moves like d6, they're playable. If you want to play real offbeat, knight c6, things, you know, you could play those kind of moves. Um, but he takes d4 is the move to play, right? That's the normal move. Now we see c3, and um. White gambits a pawn, and also he's threatening to set up the full pawn center, the dual pawn center. Again, several moves that can be played. One is d5, which leads us into like a form of the Scotch gambit. Uh, Capablanca's favorite moves, which is definitely playable. And this takes advantage of the fact that after, um, yeah, let's just look at it. This takes advantage of the fact that after. E takes d5. The queen can be played without fear to d5 because white has blocked the uh, natural square for the knight, which would normally be hitting the queen. But since the c3 pawn is there, the queen can come out uh, boldly and then play many times ago, you know, like that. Okay, so d5 is possible. Also, Queen E7 is an oddball line that is also playable. But sticking to the main line and ideas, Bragmov, Bragmov just simply took the pawn, which is normal. So D5 and D takes C3 are basically the main lines. Now Nakamura plays Bishop C4, so now he's offering the Danish. He's, he's saying, hey, take that other pawn. So it would have been interesting to see what Nakamura would have played here. However, Ibragimov plays a reliable uh, continuation with knight c6. And this basically gives uh, white an equal game here. Also, instead of bishop c4, knight c3 is also normal and respectable. This is known as the Goring uh, Gambit. Naka was trying to get into the Danish, but Ibragimov didn't take, so he just played the reliable knight c6, just developing. Knight f3, Naka keeps developing, and he wants Black to take that second pawn. So he's he could have played knight takes c3, but he wants he wants Black to take that pawn. Ibragimov has a lot of respect 
for the uh, tactical nature of Nakamura's play. So he just plays real solid. Plays D6. He guards E5. Again from any future events. And now he's ready to get his bishop on C8 out. As well as his knight on uh, G8 out. Queen B3. Again. Ignoring that pawn. So he desperately wants a Brock Ibragimov to take on B2. So now, Queen B3 simply just threatens this pawn here on F7. What a primitive attack. <laughs> um, another idea, and like I say, normally there's um, more than one idea behind these attacking moves. Is he kind of forces uh, black to block his c8 bishop in. So, in other words, this text queen b3 is making it somewhat more difficult for black to develop. So, for instance, if Nakamura just played castles right here, then the bishop probably could just swing out for g4. Now the idea is if he takes b2, b, uh, bishop takes b2, and then bishop e6. Relatively uh, equal games. So queen b3. But again, right here, it's more. It's not really about a positional evaluation. It's more about the players getting to positions where they uh, feel at their best at. Nakamura is trying to get to a, a tactically rich position where he he was, you know, at the time definitely was renowned for uh, playing his opponents in wild. Oh, Queen D7. And that's what I was talking about. He had to block his C8 bishop. Because he guards the f7 pawn. And you might say, well, why not queen e7? The problem with queen e7 now is after knight takes c3, he has to worry about this knight coming here. And say after knight f6, castle, right? And now it is hard for black to say develop this bishop because of this b7 uh, develop so for instance bishop here the b7 square is attacked by the queen this bishop on f8 is locked in and knight d5 right and this time if knight takes then this position gets opened up and bishop g5 is a threat so, there's a lot of difference in the move queen e7 and queen d7. So therefore, queen d7 is a better move. Nakamura castles, again, giving black an opportunity to ca uh, capture on b2. And you can get the idea by now is that uh, Ibragimov is sticking to his strategy. And he just wants to develop calmly and quietly and have an equal position. So, he plays knight a5. Why not take the bishop here? Right, that's a small, small, minuscule advantage, but why not take it? So, the, the now, this is risky because he moves a piece twice in the opening. So, to gain the bishop here, he's kind of violating the opening principles. And again, these GMs know when it's safe to do so. And um, so here he's moving the knight twice because look at Black's position. Where's the development? Right? And he's moving the knight to go after the bishop. Okay. So, queen takes c3. And now he blocks this knight from coming here. Protects his queen. The queen had to move anyway. But, at the same time, he's attacking. 
This facilitates a trade of pieces. Knight takes c4, queen takes c4, so it gains the bishop here. Right? And we can say that even though white is a pawn down, he has excellent compensation. So knight e7. Again, black is trying to keep this position as close as possible while he's behind in development. And it's up to Nakamura to try to find a way to bust it open to exploit the lead in development. So, knight e7. And part of the idea of knight e7 is to bring that knight to g6. So, knight c3. Let me give you an example. So, if he goes for e5. I say d5. And queen c6 would probably even be better offering the trade of queens. So Naka has to be careful. So he finally brings his knight out to c3. Knight g6. What does knight g6 do? It keeps an eye on e5. Because that's an important move. The for um that's really right at this point the most dangerous move white has to break open the position. So knight g6 keeps an eye on all of that. Bishop e3 brings his last minor piece. Another possibility was knight d4 with the idea of going to f5. So bishop e and knight f5. But bishop e3 was played. And now uh, Bragimov takes the time to do c6. Now this move prevents knight b5 or knight d5, but uh, d6. Is weakened now, so now black has to keep an eye on that. Um, black again is slowly unraveling the position. Remember, black is up a pawn, so if he could get to get to the ending, he has good winning chances. So he's just slowly unraveling. The onus is on white to prove the, uh, compensation for that pawn uh, deficit there. Again, black's main strategy is keeping the position closed as possible. So knight d4 and knight e5 now attacking the queen. Queen e2, queen g4, and of course, black goes for the trade of queens. And not only does he do that, but of course, he would love to liberate the bishop on c8. So as soon as he got a chance. He does it, and he does it with tempo. Of course, uh, Nakamura does not want to trade queens at this at this moment. Another part of this move that I like is White, of course, would like to be able to do a move like f4. Not here, but say in this position, if it was, uh, you know, White had the opportunity, he would love to do a move like f4 and drive this knight away. Of course, right in that position, he would go there. But he would love to be able to have that scenario to play f4 and say the pawn's in h3 already and drive this knight somewhere else. So queen g4 kind of like throws a monkey wrench in that plan. Because he doesn't mind f3 because f3, although it gains a tempo on the queen, the queen wanted to move anyway so he can move his bishop uh, off of c8. But then at the same time, uh, his knight is secured on e5. Plays queen h5, which is a good move. I like queen g6 too. Um, this move keeps the opposition with the white queen. And we always talk about opposition. So that f4 is not an option. If f4, then, then the queen, uh, queen takes queen is possible. So Nakamura, being as talented as he is, finds a good move. Nice CB5, and it's interesting too because I just said a few minutes ago that the purpose of playing C6 was to prevent Knight D5 and a Knight coming to B5. But again, Nakamura, you know, very, very strong and talented player. Even when he was in his teens, you see, he finds a way to do it anyway. And basically, he realizes the critical stage in the game. He realizes, hey. 
um, I'm still down the pawn. And if things keep going like this, um, eventually I'm going to be, you know, lose, you know, struggling in the end game. Uh, not only is he down the pawn, black is close to castling, and he has the bishop here. So soon, that little uh, lead in development will mean nothing. So therefore, he tries to open the position. He offers this piece, right, while he has this tremendous lead in development. So C takes B5, right? Um, the Bragimov pretty much has to take. Now he takes B5, so now he's up a piece. King D8, because the fork was threatened. So the positional intuition and Nakamura is awesome. If Rook B8, then Bishop takes A7, of course. King D8. Rook F D1. Again. Talking about the opposition again. See? King here. Excuse me, Rook here. King here. It's always a good move. Even though it's matter of fact, even though he happens to be threatening the pawn. Bishop D7. Right? So he covers up the king and he's he's saying, okay. I'll give up, I'll give you back d6. Now here is where I think Nakamura makes a mistake. As he plays this move a4. Now he keeps the pieces on the board, but why not uncover the king? And I think he was saying why trade pieces at this point. Right? But I think that some sometime you have to cash in on whatever the qualities are. And yet, position. In other words, he I think he held on to his cards too long. So, after knight takes d6, bishop takes d6. Rook takes d6. King e7. Queen d2. Bishop c6. Queen b4. Again, there's the opposition. Queen on b4. King on e7. a5. Queen c5. b6. Queen d4. Notice not not queen a3. You would like to keep the opposition, but it won't work because of the fork here. Then these two pieces be threatened. So queen d4. Rook hc8. Rook c1. And f6. And I mean, this game is up for grabs at this point. I think uh, white has full compensation. It's very active, but again, it's a dang, it's a tactical game. This is the type of game that you want if you play this opening. So, a4 is played. It kind of gives uh, black a little time to get things together here. So now bishop e7. Bishop takes a7. So he grabs the pawn. Not... So much just to be a uh, pawn grabbing, but it makes b6 available for his pieces now. So, rook takes a7. Good move by Ibragimov. He gets rid of the dangerous bishop. Knight takes a7. g5. Now, this move right here puts white in the driver's seat. And this is like a panic or, or a gamble, whatever you want to call it, by Black, which happens to pay off. He had been defending very well, but the pressure eventually gets to him. Now, correct here is to play this move, Bishop G5. And what's the merits of G5? Like, why play G5? First, it stops the Rook from going to C1. See how the C1 square is guarded. And... Secondly, the dark square is extremely weak. Why? Because black is the only one with a dark square bishop. Three, white has no dark square bishop. I just said that to contest. So, black's, black bishop can dominate. Okay, that's the main idea. But, at the same time, it's counterintuitive to play bishop g5 
and allow a pawn in front of the king to be captured like that. But that's the uh, that's the way to go. So after rook takes d6, bishop f4 threatening mate, not mate, but uh, caption on h2 and rook d6 at the same time. Rook d7, king d7, rook d1, king e7, h3, queen g5, rook c8, knight to c3, threatening check right there on d5, king f8, knight d5, and knight g6. And black has consolidated and is now better. So... But again, who knows what type of time trouble they were in. And it's a difficult uh, variation to uh, calculate over the board. So if Brag Bragamore played g5. And for some reason, Naka played h3. And he might have been nervous about g4. For some reason. Um, and it's a pure defensive move. And in this type of position. You really can't make pure defensive moves. You have to be. White has to attack. White has to continue. Uh, to attack here. So. Um, so it's an inter interesting psychological moment. Because Nakamura had been attacking the entire game. And then all of a sudden. It was Black who lashes out with G5. So it must have kind of shocked him, Nakamura that is, and then he went on the defensive. But just simply knight b5, attacking that pawn again, and then say if g4, right? Like if he continues with the plan, then there's the f4 we talked about. And notice now the queens can't be traded. And knight f3, g takes, g takes queen d2. And the idea is to check on a5. So rook g8, king h1, and uh, rook g2. So it looks like it's all over for um, for black here. However, excuse me, for white. I did this move. However, there's a saving. This is the only move and the winning move. There's no defense. So, for instance, uh, b6. Queen takes b6. King e8. Queen b8. Bishop d8. Knight takes d6. Check. King f7. Knight f5. Check. King e8. Queen e5, check. King f8. Queen h8. And this is an uh, awesome part of the variation. Rook g8. And rook to d7. Of course, if rook takes a8, h8, then rook d8 mate. And of course, that is an uh, awesome, awesome line. And of course, no one expects someone to find that over the board. That's very hard. Maybe not knight b5 so much, but the continuation afterward. Because I'm sure Nakamura probably seen this part, this, and this. And didn't want any part of it. Because even if you see that there's a check on a5 afterward, right? Rook g8 here and here. And you say, okay, I can check on a5. It's hard to see. That it leads to a forced victory at the end. So that's kind of one of those situations. Where you get into these sharp positions. You live by the sword. Die by the sword. You know that. Sometimes to win you have to play. Like a real risky counterintuitive looking. Um, move. So here. Although G5 was a mistake by Ibragimov. It paid off. So Nakamura played h3. Figures, hey, let me just stop that move in the beginning. g4 anyway.
and F4 and then we see the same idea so now you might be saying hey wait a minute what if he just captures right H takes G4 then there's a surprise Bishop takes G4 and the idea is real simple and now what Queen D2 check and white is in serious trouble here and it dropped the, the rook that's just a sample line and if f takes g4 same thing bishop takes and with the idea of h takes knight g4 and this is a dangerous um, battery right here and the same same analogous outcome So this is why Nakamura plays f4 and knight f3 and the idea is just simply to open up everything. King h1, Naka doesn't want any part of it. He plays rook g8. e5. And now G takes H3. And now Nakamura cracks under pressure and plays G3, which looks on the surface, it looks really good because it keeps the position closed on the king side, right? Pretty much. It seems like it does. But after Rook takes G3, now what? E takes d6. Bishop f6. And now it's black's king who is protected. He has that one square on d8. Where he can be assailed from. It's queen c2. Threatening mate. Right? He wants to play queen c7. And now... If Bragmar plays a real nice move here, which looks like a variation we looked at earlier, just simply rook g2. And why does this work now? Because if queen c7, now there's no piece guarding the e-file anymore. So after queen c7 check, the king would just simply scoot over. Then would be just fine see before the queen was here so this was guarded and there was no place for the king to go here but the king is um, protected from mate so once the queen came over here right now this escape is open and maybe that's what Nakamura overlooked that now he doesn't have that mate on c2 and after rook g2, Nakamura resigned. So that was a very exciting and dramatic game. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that game in the Danish gambit or slash goring gambit. The first game it was a pure Danish. Nakamura tried to get it. And um, it shows that, um, you know, that there's practical... There's practical uh, chances uh, that arise during games, and sometimes we miss the opportunity. So it, it just shows you the ideas, though. However, um, you know Nakamura trying to get his type of position, and we've seen the play with the black pieces playing real solid, and just trying to slowly unravel his position. But even he wound up making a mistake, and uh, unfortunately for Nakamura, he wasn't able to capitalize on the mistake and then later on um you know it, it, it you know the position ebbed and flowed and that was that's what i found exciting about the game i uh, see black was playing real accurate at the beginning just nipping the counterplay in the butt slowly 
and the bud slowly uh, going towards an end game. I like this move a lot. We play c6. And just playing the moves that had to be made. Like right here, this position is awesome for black. And I love this move by Nakamura because he just sensed the right moment. That, hey, I'm up in development. I have to get this position open. And he went for it. And unfortunately, he prevented himself from getting a brilliancy because he wasn't able to uh, follow up and win the game. But he had to play on the ropes and he just could not execute. Remember, he played a4 here instead of probably the better knight d6. Then continuing on, this move right here is clearly an error uh, by black. And this move had to be played, again, counterintuitive because why would he just want to move the knight back after he just captured over there? He figured... He figured he could just stifle an attack with h3. It didn't work out. Brilliant play again by Abragmov in generating this attack out of basically nothing. So that's it. So anyway, I hope you like that game. And please like and subscribe. I'll see you later.